Please forgive me. Um, this is meant to be more professional, more academic, uh, and hopefully challenging to you. Uh, John MacDonald in his presentation talked about the challenges of uh, wounds in a, in a disaster zone. Trudy's mentioned th this issue about evidence and guidance for practice. One of the things that I want to do is to talk about what I think is another key element in getting credibility for this subject is looking at wound healing in an academic setting. And seeing the big beast in the front row here, uh, I'm saying, this is Professor Bernand if you don't know, uh, this is not a professor of vascular surgery having an interest in wounds, it's trying to put wounds front and center within a clinical and academic environment that actually allows you to, to give credibility to this subject and you don't have to depend on a single individual, whether it's a surgeon, a physician, a nurse, a physiotherapist or whoever, to actually have that interest in the subject in addition to their day job. What I'm going to talk about are my own personal views. Uh, I'll let you decide which one's me. Kevin Banan's the other one. Um, uh, to actually explore this thing so you can criticize me as much as you like but I'll, I'll take the risk. I belong to Cardiff University uh, and Cardiff University is important because it's one of the Russell group of universities. For those of you who don't have an academic appointment is to recognize beyond Oxford, Cambridge and London the next top 20 universities belong to the Russell group. As a Russell Group University, it's research intensive. As a consequence, to one get in to a Russell Group University with a wound healing interest, um, my own group has survived there for 21 years, has been a battle. I have to apologize to my colleagues on many occasions why we're doing anything about wounds in a Russell Group University. I also belong to the School of Medicine. And we know that medics are arrogant sons of bitches. All right? That is a caricature of, of, of medicine and medics, but in many ways it's true. The difficulty about the School of Medicine, it's about making sure that in addition to doing high quality research, we also do, or we also train. Uh, people who become high quality doctors when they graduate from the School of Medicine. The history of wounds in Cardiff is long. And any of you who believe that you're going to change the world overnight, recognize that that's probably over ambitious. Recognize we go back to 1972. And it has nothing to do with me. It is to do with my hero and predecessor, Les Hughes, who Professor Bernand will remember. He unfortunately died last year. One of the things that's important is to recognize that he set up a clinic in the University Hospital of Wales to treat surgical wounds healing by secondary intention or surgical wounds that got infected. By 1980, we realized that we were seeing increasing numbers of patients with chronic wounds. Our interest in chronic wounds happened by default, happened out of necessity. Our real interest originally uh, in Cardiff was around surgical wounds and surgical wound infection. In 1991, uh, the Wound Healing Research Unit was born, and it was an academic group focused on wound healing in the Department of Surgery, and in many ways was because of the position and patronage of Les Hughes. In 2004, as the university went through various changes and morphed into different things, we had, for the first time in the world, a Department of Wound Healing. In 2007, following another merger and reorganization, we merged the Dermatology and Wound Healing. So we'd gone from surgery to independence and then into Dermatology and Wound Healing. <coughs> There was another reorganization last year, and they got rid of all the clinical departments, and they created the Time Institute. I direct the Time Institute, so you are in the presence of a Time Lord. 
I just wish I could transport myself through time sometimes. What is the Time Institute? It is an institute in the medical school that sits alongside the Pew Research Institutes, the Medical Education Institute, and focuses on translational research rather than pure basic research, focuses on innovation, methodology, and engagement. You could say it's the dog's breakfast of things that if you don't belong in the other institutes, you end up in time. It's the biggest of the institutes in the medical school and has about 250 members of academic staff, which uh, I uh, have to try and manage. I've been on a course, everybody's been on a course, and time has a mission. And uh, these are lots of big words that actually mean bugger all, other than the fact that what we're trying to do is to recognize in a medical school we have to be grounded. One of the things that people often talk about is the bench-to-bedside research. One of the things that's important is recognizing in medical schools, in mainstream Russell Group universities, they're very good at the bench, but are they as good at the bedside? And the other thing that's also important is to recognize that in developing things for the basic researchers, we may, may need to look at bedside problems and drive them back to the bench to try and understand how best to manage these patients. This is scary as hell, uh, but this is a, a schematic to talk about what we've got uh, in the Time Institute. In central administration, we have operations facilities, education in innovation. One of the things that's interesting for our um, graduates, 50% of our graduates go into general practice. If they become partners in general practice, they're self-employed businessmen. But we don't teach them anything about business or innovation in their undergraduate course. We're heavily involved in a whole range of innovation engagement. Uh, we, I, we also manage a 35 million pound imaging uh, facility. We have a research support office, a unit that actually looks at all research applications uh, within the, the medical school. We have a, a range of clinical trials units. We have the Welsh Institute for Forensic Medicine. We have certain components of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. We're linked with simulation. We have a collaboration with Bristol University, linked to the, the NHS in Cardiff and Vale, and we're linked to uh, academic health science centres across the whole of Wales. But wound healing sits in the middle here because a lot of our research is translational research. The mistake we made when we created the wound healing research in, in 1991 was to put this sign on the door, call it a wound clinic. Our original interest was pylonidal sinus wound healing, surgical wounds healing by secondary intention. Uh, by putting the sign on the door and calling it a wound clinic, we saw all these chronic wounds because we then realized that all of these chronic wounds were in the healthcare system, but now colleagues had a, a, an escape route. Rather than having a go at managing these chronic wounds, they had a, a, a legitimate place to send these patients because they didn't know what the hell to do with them. And if you call yourself a wound clinic, hopefully you'll know what to do with them. Having an interest in wound healing and having an interest in uh, dealing with clinical problems associated with wounds, we were able to develop new surgical options. This is a patient with hydradenitis suppurativa, and we probably have the largest series in the world of patients who've undergone radical excision of apocrine sweat gland bearing skin uh, who have this particular disease that affects those sweat glands. One of the other things that's also important, and bearing in mind we are a medical school, we have to ask ourselves the question, are we focused on wound dressing, wound management, or wound healing? We are very deliberately called a wound healing research unit, not a wound dressing research unit, or a wound management research unit, or a wound care research unit. Wound healing, and it may be personal interpretation, uh, implies much more of a biologically based, much more of a comprehensive approach to heal wounds when you can heal them, although we do recognize you will not be able to heal every patient with every wound that you might see. Just to try and get some audience participation again and make sure you're not late for coffee, who was, which professional group was needed to help manage this patient? Shout out. Tissue viability, plastic surgeons, wrong. <laughs> District nurse, dietitian, 
multidisciplinary, you're getting the message. The important thing, however, is somebody needs to make the diagnosis. And this is a patient who has a non-healing wound here, a non-healing wound from movable of, movement of the stoma from there to there, and a wound here that was claimed to be pyoderma gangrenosum, uh, but did not respond to high-dose uh, oral therapy. This in, is, in fact, a patient who is being treated with nicarandil for ischemic heart disease. And this is a relatively new and often unrecognized cause of non-healing of wounds. Where nicarandil being treated for, given to the patient for ischemic heart disease can prevent your wounds from healing and can give you exquisitely painful wounds. And it was all of the above, apart from the plastic surgeon, um, uh, who were needed there. But it needed to be somebody who was interested and focused in wound healing. Because this was a patient who ended up with us, having been through 10 specialists and all sorts of people before they fell into our lap. And I'm not claiming credit for being bloody brilliant, because I'm not. I'm claiming credit for the fact that we thought of it because we're focused on what is happening to patients with wounds that aren't healing and what are the diseases or factors or conditions that may be present which may cause that wound not to heal. And all we did from the left to the right was to stop the nicarandal with the help and the support for the cardiologist. Remove the drug, the wound heals on its own. So if you have a focus, you may be able to do much more for these patients. This is an important slide because I, I, I keep banging on about the fact we're a medical school, not a healthcare school or a school of nursing. Whether you like it or not, I think you have to get medical engagement to have credibility for the subject. You have to have medical engagement if you're going to provide best care for patients. The other thing that's also important about doctors, apart from being arrogant sons of bitches, they're a bit like Pavlov's dogs when they're medical students. One of the big problems about doctors not involved in wound healing is I'm not taught as an undergraduate, it can't be important, so I'm not going to even think about it. What we've done by creating a department in a medical school and making sure all the final uh, your exams have questions on wound healing. Many of the medical students in Cardiff now, or now know a little bit more about wound healing and recognize that wound healing may be an important clinical problem. We are very focused on providing a multidisciplinary team approach for patients with wounds because none of us, whether we're vascular surgeons, plastic surgeons, dietitians, tissue viability nurses, or whatever, are going to have all the skills and abilities to manage all of the patients with all of the wound types that you see. It's about, if I can't do it, I, I take the responsibility to find a man or a woman who can provide the help and expertise to manage these patients properly. If we're going to exist in a medical school, we have to provide a clinical service, which may be a tertiary referral practice, maybe about changing practice locally. We have to do research and we have to develop education, and part of that was developing the first master's course in tissue repair in the world. Because one of the big challenges is when you actually look in the healthcare systems wherever you are, you will find lots of these patients, but who's looking after them? And it could be any of the above uh, that you mentioned when we said who should look after that previous case. We need to recognize that the numbers of patients and the cost of those uh, wound healing problems are significant. Just taking two examples, surgical wound infection and pressure ulcers. If it's such a big problem in numbers, if it's such a big problem in cost, why aren't we developing many more dedicated wound healing groups based on a multidisciplinary approach to provide uh, appropriate care for patients? One of the other things that we need to do is going bedside to bench. Here's a stack of clinical problems, but what's the biological processes and what's the aberrations in those biological processes that actually are causing these clinical problems? This is a schematic to talk about the complexity of the molecular and biological basis for wound healing. And this is a gross oversimplification uh, of what's really happening, as Dr. Dye will tell you from Raft. The other thing that's interesting about dogma around wounds, I, I just find that it's not a comprehensive review like uh, Trudy has done with, with debridement. This was just a paper that caught my eye from 2009 from the Journal of the American College of Surgeons where they were looking at taking debrided tissue from chronic wounds, reasonable numbers of debridements, 
And when they looked at these histologically, when the pathologist had determined that there was hyperkeratosis, fibrosis, necrosis, or osteomyelitis present on the debrided tissue. If you're involved in diabetic foot disease, you'd say these figures here in terms of percentages are probably understandable. But how many of you, if you're into leg ulcers, would have even thought that a third of your patients might have hyperkeratosis, 15% have fibrosis, 20% necrosis, and according to this paper, 30% of those patients have osteomyelitis. The important thing is recognizing what we know, but also challenging what we know to identify what we really know and what needs to be known to go forward. One of the other things that's important to recognize is that you, there have been changes, but there are still many more changes that, and many more uh, experiments and, and clinical trials that need to be done to understand what's going on. I've talked about the Wound Healing Research Unit when healing is appropriate. And this is where I will argue with many of my medical and surgical colleagues that wound healing, although an understandable outcome measure, is not the only measure of success in caring for patients with wounds. And my justification is if I'm an oncologist or if I'm a rheumatologist, you don't measure my success in how many patients I've cured of cancer, but it may be how much longer they live for or how I've improved their quality of life. You don't measure my success of how many patients I've cured of rheumatoid arthritis, but it may be looking at their ability to remain mobile and independent. We are, in many of these chronic wounds, we're dealing with uh, chronic disease, therefore we're never going to cure the underlying pathophysiology, but maybe we can offer something that's appropriate for that patient. This is a patient of mine where I don't think I've done them any favours. patient with diabetic foot disease had an ulcer on the dorsum of that second toe, worked our socks off to heal it, but have I done them any favours? Because of that deformity on that second toe, the risk of secondary uh, ulceration on that toe is enormous. Would it have been much better to have suggested or recommended amputation of that second toe? In many wound healing circles, that would be judged as a failure not a success. And this is a, a, an editorial that myself and a couple of colleagues wrote in the BMJ a few years ago uh, commenting on uh, two uh, reviews around wound healing and, and new data on wound healing. And we believe it's unrealistic to use complete healing as an, a primary outcome measure and more appropriate to adopt a broader based approach but it's tailor made to different subgroups for different interventions. big issue around wounds, acute and chronic wounds, is diagnosing and treating infection. Recognizing that a whole host of antimicrobials are out there. Recognizing that in many ways we're still in our infancy because where's the accuracy in diagnosing infection? Where's the efficacy of different interventions of resolving infection? Because although there's been the Vulcan study subsequent to this review on evidence about uh, anti topical antimicrobials, we have to ex accept there are huge gaps in our knowledge and understanding of how we both diagnose and treat infection. One of the other little-known facts is Cardiff, as well as being famous for rugby, we think, uh, it's also the place where Cochrane was based when he described the randomized control trial uh, as the gold standard of evidence. And the evidence around what we do in wounds has huge holes in it. Now, I don't apologize for that. I will just say that is merely a reflection of us lagging behind mainstream clinical or medical subjects where they've had a 20, 30 year start on us in doing good quality research that is designed in a way that's appropriate for measuring a, an impact or a value of, of the particular interventions. But what we should do is accept as wound healing professionals, because that's what you are, is that we can't ignore evidence-based practice, but we have to recognize where we, start, where we stand at this moment in time and our starting point in this maturity uh, curve of how we do things. 
Now, David Sackett uh, is another famous name in, in the evidence-based medicine, evidence-based practice world. And one of the things that's important is that although uh, Archie talked about RCTs as the gold standard of evidence and it's based on p-values and all the issues about blinding, double blinding and randomization, one of the things that's important is you realize that the, the definitions about evidence-based medicine mature. Uh, this comes from uh, uh, David Sackett's work published by Strauss in 2005, evidence-based medicine, the integration of the best research evidence with our clinical expertise and our patients' unique values and circumstances. And that broader definition is often forgotten, and people say it's just a p-value. This is from the Cochrane Cl Clinical Evidence Review in 2008 about leg ulcers. I'm not saying I agree or disagree, I'm just reporting to you this is what has been published. In, oh, shit. Sorry. In terms of standard treatments, they have claimed compression bandages have been shown to be beneficial. Good news. Likely beneficial, peri-ulcer intralesional injection of granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. How many of you have ever heard of it? How many of you have ever done it? Unlikely beneficial and unknown. Many more in the unknown group than in these groups here. In addition, in terms of adjuvant treatments, they have claimed pentoxyphylin or Trental at double the normal dose is beneficial, as proven by RCTs, as proven by meta-analysis. Now, how many of you claim to be evidence-based practitioners prescribe or ask for somebody else to prescribe for a patient you're treating? 800 milligrams three times a day of oral Trenta. Is that because you're an evidence-based practitioner when it suits and you're not an evidence-based practitioner when it doesn't suit? Or is it the fact that you will learn by bitter experience that if you give a bunch of patients 800 milligrams three times a day of Trental, 50% of them get raging diarrhea and they won't tolerate it? Where does that fit in the evidence-based pyramid? The other thing to mention about likely beneficial stuff down here is a whole host of unknown. The interesting thing is in last month, yeah, August, uh, the HTA call for proposals is now starting to get focused in this area because there's a call out for research, research pro studies to be done to try and show whether oral aspirin does help the healing of leg ulcers or not. The other thing, in terms of organizational interventions, and please don't shout at me, recognize I'm coming to a leg club meeting. Don't shoot the messenger. They say it's unknown whether leg ulcer clinics work. But good news, folks, in that same call from the HTA, they're asking for proposals to show whether you can demonstrate that leg ulcer clinics do work. Important thing is to recognize what we know, what we don't know in the field of leg ulcers. But government departments or agencies linked to the government are actually getting interested in leg ulcers because in the recent call for HTA proposals, two things are related to leg ulcers. There's another one that relates to smoking and wound healing in surgical wounds. The problem we've got with wounds is that there's huge numbers. This is stuff that Doug Queen and I have done for, for, for other things. We recognize that linked to those big numbers, there's huge costs. But the thing that we do need to recognize is what we have to appreciate is that we've probably been awash with treatments before we had the appropriate breadth of assessment and diagnostic, diagnosis or diagnostic tools to help us select the right treatments appropriately. And what we haven't had is linking assessment and diagnosis with a treatment to appropriate service delivery leading to a total integrated approach. Please do not mention it outside this room because I'm frightened 
about this business about calling it woundology. Woundology is very much tongue-in-cheek, but it goes back to those old deep BT adverts. Unless you had a knowledge, you didn't have a science. All right? And it is this business that if we are going to be credible about talking about wounds, talking about wound healing, to get the engagement from medical colleagues, other clinical colleagues, managers and government, we have to have a recognition of understanding pathophysiology, appreciating epidemiology, evaluating interventions, and pulling it all together so we can be much more confident that every patient with a wound is plugged into a system where, the, as John said in his talk at the beginning, you do the simple things first, you do the simple things well, because that will deal with 80% of your patients. Going back to our own research in a medical school, focused on pilonidal sinus disease, this is work that we published in 1985 to show that in surgical wounds, pilonidal sinus wounds, laparotomy wounds, and axillary wounds, if you measure size, plotted against time, you can actually draw this regression line where you can ca subsequently calculate how long it's going to take for that wound to heal based on size. Here in this study, we've shown the presence of an absence of bacteroides influencing the rate of healing. And it's led to our uh, approach to say that in pilonidal sinus wounds, it's, it's the anaerobic organisms that are the main predictor of whether you're going to have a problem or not, not the staphs and the streps. This other study that we published when Paul Ehrt was with us was if you do pilonidal sinus excisions, you know you've got fat in the base of the wound and anything between the fat and the top is granulation tissue. And how many of us are guilty of saying, if you see a patient with a wound healing by secondary intention, we need more granulation tissue? <coughs> and this study published in 1998, we've shown if you measure the thickness of that granulation tissue, it only ever gets to about five or six millimeters depth. And in this wound model, in this part of the body, new tissue only contributes 8% of total wound closure. The rest of the closure is brought about by contraction of the surrounding tissue. And a simple way to try and explain that, if you have a big hole that's healing by secondary intention, the hole is much, always much bigger than the scar you end up with. And just as we need to encourage granulation tissue to form, we also need to appreciate contraction of the surrounding tissue may be important drivers as whether that wound's going to heal or not. This is a slide I use frequently. Hopefully you all agree just looking at that, that's probably venous disease in the leg. But what we tend to do is assume if you've got venous disease in the leg and you've got a hole in that leg, that's a venous ulcer. But how true is that? Where does the dis definitive test to say that is a venous ulcer rather than a limb with venous disease in it? Work when Mike Clark was with us looking at sub-bandage pressures says that the literature with elastic bandage systems, you have this gradient of 40 to 18 from ankle to knee. But are we praying to a false god if we recognize when you monitor sub-bandage pressure, when you move the ankle, when you walk the patient, the pressures move up and down? I'm not saying compression bandages aren't effective, but do we really understand the mode of action of compression bandage systems? Another thing we've had this interest in is infection, surgical infection, a patient following surgery for necrotizing fasciitis, which I would say clinically is not infected, but is stuffed full of bugs because of where it is, and a donor site that's three months old that's not healing, which I would say is infected based on the fact that it's not healing. This is the paper that Keith Cutting and I published in 1994 to talk about the clinical features of uh, local infection, what we call local infection. My hypothesis at the moment is that is probably the clinical features that are linked to when you have a biofilm forming within that wound. But I don't have data from clinical studies to confirm that. That is where we have to take the clinical problem and drive it back to the lab to try and understand what is going on and can we correlate clinical appearance with the presence or absence of a biofilm in the wound. This is another study we published in 2007 where we've actually shown we can correlate bacterial growth on the surface with bacterial growth from tissue biopsy and culture. Because for anybody wanting to develop a new product with anti-infective claims in the US, the FDA insists that the only test for wound infection is tissue biopsy and culture. 
It's not surface culture. This is a study published a few years ago to show the impact of debriding chronic wounds. Can you convert non-healing to healing by just debriding them? This is work that we've done with uh, Patricia Price developing the Cardiff Wound Impact Schedule, a disease-specific quality of life tool for lower leg wounds being validated. This is from a HTA study on diabetic foot ulcers. And the interesting thing, in this 300-patient study, if we look at uh, measures of physical activity of quality of life, both on entry and during the study, the patients who go on to heal had a higher quality of life on entry and throughout the study. Same with their social life. Just look at the red line. Same as their well-being. The interesting thing there is that those who go on to heal may rate their health-related quality of life higher at baseline, indicating a potential role for psychological factors in healing. There is a well-established axis, the neuropsychoimmunological axis, where if you're feeling positive about things, it may well have an impact on your ability to heal, and that may be one of the reasons, one of the many complex reasons, why leg clubs are successful. This is work which is the subject of, of some filings of uh, uh, intellectual property where we're basically saying you can take a gene signature and you can differentiate between acute wounds and chronic wounds and healing chronic and non-healing chronic wounds. And maybe there's a biological basis of being able to predict whether wounds are going to heal or not. Again, work from the group. This publication, I think, is important for us because this was when we were commissioned by the British Medical Journal to write a series, an ABC series on wound healing in 2006. Led to the, the, this book. It's, it's, it's not really a, a, an academic text. It's just a practical guide to doctors in the United Kingdom about wound healing. I'm here representing a, a big, complex team that worked in this area for over 20 years. I'm not a one-man band. There's a whole range of people with a whole range of complementary skills who work together. One of the things that we've done with the Wound Healing Research Unit, it's been in existence for 21 years now, is to be self-funded from day one and are still self-funded. In terms of funding, long-term funding was from academic grants, but we weren't going to get academic grants until we had a track record. You don't have a track record until you get an academic grant, but we brought academic grants more so in recent years. Medium-term funding was funding from the NHS, but where do you find the budget you're going to target in the NHS because of silo budgeting men mentality? Short term, and this is again controversial, I genuinely believe that you can have a true partnership with industry. As long as you are clear what you're bringing to the party and what you want out of it. These are our academic outputs and self-sufficiency in terms of publications, in terms of grants, in terms of clinical studies links with companies uh, and higher degrees, et cetera, et cetera. This is our final bit that we're, we're getting into now where we are very close to uh, developing uh, the first national wound healing center in the UK funded by our Welsh government, where we integrate academic, clinical, and commercial activities in wounds in Wales uh, and links everybody within Wales that's focused in wounds from whatever background they come. We will collect, collaborate, consult, and communicate. We will, there will be benefits of both the, the, the innovation center and the uh, a science park that's linked around it, a virtual science park. Unfortunately, we're not first in the world because a group in Australia who uh, I uh, advised to, as I have an appointment at one of the Australian universities, I've got a $28 million grant uh, for an eight-year program for wounds across Australia. What will be the future of wounds? I don't know. Pigs might fly. Maybe we'll have Star Trek approaches to wounds. What I have done is to talk, take you very briefly through our journey of trying to get wound healing established in an academic setting, particularly in a medical school. We have made mistakes, but we certainly have worked hard. The important thing is to recognize, that, I guess because I'm a risk taker, uh, that have been some challenges, um, but it has helped in some way or another in our view and the view of external agencies that the group in Cardiff has established a presence in an academic setting and is recognized as being credible in a, in a mainstream medical school working in the field of wound healing. Thanks for your time.